Hello there, welcome to our channel. Today we will be discussing one of the very important condition related to our brain, that is viral encephalitis. Our brain, an intricate network of neurons and synapses, and is it serious threat due to a viral condition known as viral encephalitis. As the name suggests, it's a condition caused by a virus, and the term encephalitis means inflammation of the brain. So where this inflammation occurs, how, and what complications it can lead to, is the area of discussion today. So without wasting any time, let's get started. Let's discuss the causes of viral encephalitis first. It can be caused by any virus, like herpes simplex virus, West Nile virus, and the enteroviruses in America. Some of the other viral etiologic agents include varicella zoster virus, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, human herpes virus type 6 and 7, measles, mumps, and rubella viruses, dengue virus, and rabies virus as well. So if there is a fever and you suspect neurological signs of encephalitis, it is important to rule out if there is any inflammation in the brain. Moving forward, let's discuss the pathophysiology of viral encephalitis. The condition occurs when viruses breach the body's defenses and infiltrate the brain. These viruses like herpes simplex, West Nile, or Japanese encephalitis virus find their way to the brain, often crossing the blood-brain barrier. Once inside, these invaders provoke the body's immune system, setting off an inflammatory response within the brain. Immune cells, such as microglia, and signaling molecules called cytokines, rally together, resulting in brain tissue inflammation. This inflammation causes swelling and damage to the delicate brain tissue, disrupting its normal function. In a close look, the brain often shows swelling, blood vessel, crowding, and bleeding. It's common to see an invasion by certain white blood cells or specialized brain cells. This disruption can manifest as a range of symptoms, from fever and headache to seizures and changes in cognitive function. Viral encephalitis presents with flu-like symptoms initially, progressing to neurological manifestations such as confusion, seizures, altered consciousness, and neck stiffness. Patients may experience sensitivity to light, weakness, and behavioral changes. Severe cases can lead to coma and respiratory problems. Timely medical attention is vital for proper management and to prevent complications. Now let's discuss the diagnostic screening of viral encephalitis. Neuroimaging, like CT scans or MRI and a lumbar puncture, are crucial for diagnosing viral encephalitis. These tests help check for increased pressure in the brain and rule out certain risks before doing an LP. CT scans can reveal abnormal areas in the temporal lobes, especially when herpes simplex virus is involved. These changes typically show up a few days after the infection starts. MRI is highly sensitive in detecting signs of HSV encephalitis, especially in the temporal and frontal lobes. Analyzing cerebrospinal fluid obtained from a lumbar puncture helps check pressure, cell counts, glucose, and protein levels. It's also important for PCR testing to detect HSV-1, HSV-2, and other viruses like enteroviruses. Depending on a person's history and symptoms, additional tests like arbovirus serology and HIV testing may be recommended. Sometimes, taking a sample of brain tissue or body fluids for cultures and PCR can also help determine the cause of the illness. In CSF tests, glucose levels are usually normal, while protein levels might be moderately high, and there might be an increase in certain white blood cells called lymphocytes. However, about 10% of patients might show normal CSF results. For patients experiencing seizures, an EEG might show abnormal brain activity. Once the diagnosis is made, it's time to act. There isn't a specific medical cure for most viral infections affecting the central nervous system, so treatment for viral encephalitis mainly focuses on providing support. However, for herpes simplex virus encephalitis, there's a crucial exception. Early use of acyclovir has proven to notably reduce the risk of death and complications, lessening long-term behavioral and cognitive issues. That's why doctors usually start all patients suspected of having encephalitis on a cyclovir as a precautionary measure. Specific symptoms such as seizures, increased intracranial pressure, or other neurological complications are treated symptomatically. Medications to control seizures, reduce brain swelling, or manage other neurological issues might be administered. In some cases, 
Corticosteroids like dexamethasone might be used to reduce brain inflammation and swelling, although their effectiveness in viral encephalitis treatment is debated and not universally recommended. Treatment for viral encephalitis is complex and often requires a multidisciplinary approach involving neurologists, infectious disease specialists, intensive care physicians, and rehabilitation experts. Early diagnosis, prompt initiation of appropriate treatment, and supportive care play crucial roles in improving outcomes and reducing the risk of complications in individuals affected by viral encephalitis. The majority of individuals with viral encephalitis recover without lasting issues. However, some may experience challenges such as difficulties concentrating, behavioral changes, speech disorders, or memory problems. In rare instances, a few patients might remain in a vegetative state. In conclusion, understanding viral encephalitis is crucial for early recognition, prompt treatment, and effective prevention. While many individuals recover fully, some may face ongoing challenges. By raising awareness, prioritizing timely medical care, and advocating for preventive measures, we can strive towards better outcomes, improved quality of life, and a healthier future for all. Thank you for joining us in unraveling the complexities of viral encephalitis.